Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part four of the Illuminati by Manly P. Hall, taken from Horizon, Journal of the Philosophical Research Society, Spring 1947, Volume 6, Number 4. The Philosophy of Illuminism. The name Illuminati has been assumed by or bestowed upon various groups of mystics and metaphysical intellectualists claiming to possess an internal enlightenment about God or divine matters. A number of sects may be included under this general title, as the Lombrados of Spain and the Garinas of France. In present usage, however, the term Illuminati is applied especially to the order founded in Bavaria in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt. This movement was regarded with favor by a number of brilliant and outstanding men, including Goethe, Herder, Nikolai, Ernest II of Gotha, and Karl August of Weimar. According to Kenneth Mackenzie, the Masonic author, the object of Illuminism was the advancement of morality, education, and virtue. By the mutual assistance of good men, the society was advanced as a means of organizing the idealism of the race to combat the corruption and materialism resulting from the ignorance and selfishness of society. In presenting the work of Adam Weishaupt to the modern reader, the fair and proper course is to let the little professor of Ingolstadt explain his purposes in his own words. I have contrived a system, he writes, which possesses every advantage. It attracts Christians of every communion, gradually frees them from all religious prejudices, cultivates the social virtues, and animates them by a great, feasible, and speedy prospect of universal happiness in a state of liberty and moral equality freed from the obstacles which subordination and the inequalities of rank and wealth continually thrown in our way. Weishaupt's definition of Illuminism proves conclusively that he was neither a materialist nor a political nihilist, as has been charged. This is the great object held out by this association, the right of the common man to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the means of obtaining it is illumination, enlightening the understanding by the sun of reason, which will dispel the clouds of superstition and prejudice. The proficients in this order are therefore justly called the illuminated, and of all illumination, which human reason can give none, is comparable to the discovery of what we are, our nature, our obligation, what degree of happiness, we are capable of enjoying, and what are the means of attaining it? In comparison with this, the most brilliant scientists are but amusements for the idle and luxurious. A little later, the professor discusses the means by which the society itself is to be accomplished. The association must be gradual. Its first task must be to form the young members. As these multiply and advance, they become the apostles of benevolence, and the work is now on foot, and advances with a speed increasingly every day. The slightest observation shows that nothing will so much contribute to increase the zeal of the members as secret union. It is needless to inquire into the causes of the zeal which secrecy produces. It is an universal fact, confirmed by the history of every age. Let this circumstance of our Constitution, therefore, be directed to this noble purpose, and all the objections urged against it by jealous tyranny and a frightened superstition will vanish. The order will work silently and secretly, and through the generous benefactors of the human race are thus deprived of the applause of the world. They have the noble pleasure of seeing the work prosper in their hands. The structure of the Illuminist order, as it was perfected by Weishaupt, von Nigg, and Bode, consisted of 12 degrees, advancing subsequently 
from a simple statement of aims and purposes to an elaborate ritual based upon the mystery schools of ancient Egypt. The Illuminist presented some of the ritualistic work at the Masonic Congress at Wilhelmsbad. So magnificent was the pageantry that the Masonic brethren were profoundly impressed. Degrees of the Illuminist Order Nursery Preparation Novice Minerval Illuminatus Minor Masonry Symbolic Apprentice Fellow Craft Master Mason Scottish Illuminous Major or Scottish Novice Illuminous Dirigens or Scottish Knight Mysteries Lesser Epopt or Priest Prince or Regent Greater Magnus or Philosopher Rex King Homi Roi or Areopagite. There is some uncertainty as to the working form of the higher degrees as those attempting to expose the order never progressed into the sections called the mysteries. It also appears that certain lodges introduced symbolic elements not included in the general pattern. Candidates for initiation were selected from those possessing such qualities and temperaments as Weishaupt regarded indispensable. He thus defines those worthy of admission. Whoever does not close his ears to the lamentations of the miserable, nor his heart of the gentle pity. Whoever is a friend and a brother of the unfortunate. Whoever has a heart capable of love and friendship. Whoever is steadfast in adversity unwavering in the carrying out of whatever has been once engaged in, undaunted in the overcoming of difficulties, whoever does not mock and despise the weak, whoever has a soul susceptible of conceiving great design, desirous of rising superior to all base motives, and of distinguishing itself by deeds of benevolence, Whoever shuns idleness, whoever considers no knowledge as unessential which he may have the opportunity of acquiring regarding the knowledge of mankind as his chief study, whoever, when truth and virtue are in question, is sufficiently courageous to follow the dictates of his own heart, despising the approbation of the multitude, such a one is a proper candidate. After a candidate had been accepted and was informed of the full designs of the order, he signed the obligation of admission, which read as follows. I hereby bind myself by my honor and good name for swearing all mental reservations, never to reveal by hint, word, writing, or any other manner, whatever, even to my most trusted friend, Anything that shall be said or done to me respecting my wish for reception, and this whether my reception shall follow or not, I being previously assured that it shall contain nothing injurious to religion, the state, or good manners. I promise that I will make no intelligible extract from any papers which shall be shown to me now or during my novitiate. All this I swear, as I am, and as I hope to continue, a man of honor. Each of the grades had its own aims and obligations. The highest grade of the first division was that of Illuminist Minor. The philosophical instructions of this grade aimed to make of the human race, without distinction of nation, condition, or profession, one good and happy family. Those taking the grade of Illuminatus Minor sign the following obligation. I protest before you, the worthy plenipotentiary of the venerable order into which I desire to be admitted, that I acknowledge my natural weakness and inability, and that I, with all of my possessions, rank, honors, and titles, which I hold in political society. I am only a man. I can enjoy these things only through my fellow men. 
and through them also I may lose them. The approbation and consideration of my fellow men are indispensable, and I must try to preserve them by all my talents. These I will never use to the prejudice of the universal good, but will oppose with all my might the enemies of the human race and of political society. I will embrace every opportunity of saving mankind by cultivating my understanding and my affections, and by imparting all important knowledge, as the statues of this order require of me. I bind myself to perpetual silence and unshaken loyalty and submission to the order in the persons of my superiors, here making a faithful and complete surrender of my private judgment, my own will, and every narrow-minded employment of my power and influence. I pledge myself to account the good of the order as my own and ready to serve it with my fortune, my honor, and my blood, should I, through omission, neglect, passion, or wickedness, behave contrary to the good of the order, I subject myself to whatever reproof or punishment my superiors shall enjoy. The friends and enemies of the order shall be my friends and enemies, and with respect to both, I will conduct myself as directed by the order and am ready in every lawful way to devote myself to its increase and promotion, and therein to employ all my ability. All this I promise and protest without secret reservation, according to the intentions of the society which requires from me this engagement. This I do as I am, and I hope to continue a man of honor. The lectures read to the initiates of the society probably were prepared by Wysop himself. An extract from a discourse delivered to those receiving the Masonic degree of Illuminatus Dirigens, or Scottish Knight, is indicative of the social program advocated by the society. Men originally led a patriarchal life in which every father of the family was the sole lord of his house and his property, while he himself possessed general freedom and equality. But they suffered themselves to be oppressed, gave themselves up to civil societies, and formed states. By this they fell, and by this is the fall of man, by which they were thrust into unspeakable misery. To get out of this state, to be freed and born again, there is no other means than the use of pure reason by which a general morality may be established which will put man into a condition to govern himself, regain his original worth, and dispense with all political supports, and particularly with rulers. This can be done by no other way but by secret associations, which will be by degrees and in silence, possess themselves of the government of the states and make use of these means for this purpose which the wicked use for attaining their base end. Here is a fragment, supposedly from the degree of Rex, the highest in the order written by Weishaupt, but distinctly reminiscent of the conviction of Thomas Paine. Every peasant, citizen, and household is a sovereign, as in the patriarchal state, and nations must be brought back to the state by whatever means are conducible, peaceably if it can be done so, but if not, then by force, for all subordination must vanish from the face of the earth. These were strong words in 18th century Bavaria, but in our more generous times, the rights of men are taken for granted, and groups of all kinds are laboring industriously to overcome the false barriers of pride and prejudice. In order to conceal their purposes and protect their members, if records and correspondence fell into the hands of the uninitiated, the Illuminati created a system of feigned names for persons and places. In the archives of the order, Weishaupt was referred to as Spartus, Bon Nig was Philo, Bode was Emilius, Prince of Burnswick was Aaron, and Count Saviola was Brutusa, and so for all the members. Cities and countries were carefully confused geographically 
to make identification difficult. Munich became Athens. Ingolstadt was Ellis's. Austria was Egypt. Würzburg was Carthage. And Vienna was Rome. The Illuminatist also had a special calendar, which they called Hijara, from the Islamic. But they calculated their dates according to a Persian error, which began in 630 AD. Their year began with the vernal equinox, and they had little respect for the orthodox calendar. The order also adopted or invented a number of cipher writings which could serve their purposes. The esoteric activities of the society have never been revealed, but their import can be gathered from their association with the work of Count Saint Germain. The reference in a geographical symbolism to Austria as Egypt opens an interesting field of speculation which is worth further notice. Freemasonry in general had a difficult time in Austria. It was introduced in 1742 in the Lodge of the Three Canons, but was immediately suppressed. The Empress Maria Theresa was devoutly religious in theory, if not in practice, and further prohibited Freemasonry in 1764. In 1780, when Joseph II ascended to the throne, the fraternity was tolerated, and so continued with certain restrictions throughout his reign. Francis II, his successor, was a religious reactionary and his hostility ended the brief period of Masonic tolerance. As late as the opening years of the 20th century, Masonry was carried on only in quasi-secret manner among the Austrians. By these interesting facts, it is evident that the only period in which masonry in Austria received any official sanction coincide with the rise of Illuminism in Bavaria. Religious feeling in Austria ran high and may be summarized in the conflict between the Catholic Empress and her husband, who was himself a Freemason and inclined to view the right with enthusiasm. On one occasion, the Empress sent a hundred dragoons to break up a Masonic Lodge. The Emperor was present at the time and was forced to make an undignified exit through an open window in a back staircase. At this point, we must introduce a talented gentleman and Freemasonic brother who succeeded in surviving the tantrums of Maria Theresa, Ignaz Edler von Born, 1742-1742 to 1791. Von Born was a mineralogist and a metallurgist. Educated in a Jesuit school and a member of the society for 16 months, he gave up a religious career and studied law at Prague. In the significant year, 1776, Von Born was appointed by Maria Theresa to arrange the Imperial Museum at Vienna. He wrote several scientific books museum catalogues, and even attempted satire. Some of his works were published anonymously. He was learned in languages and took an active part in political charges, especially in Hungary. At the time of his death, he was at work on a political book. There is every indication that von Born was a member of the Illuminist Order. Although his position in the Vienna society was such that he dared not reveal his affiliations, he was the moving spirit behind a group of liberals furthering the cause of intellectual revolution. Through von Born, we are introduced to three interesting characters. Karl Ludwig Gieseke, Emanuel Schickender, and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. These three Masonic brothers contributed in various ways and degrees to the production of a Masonic opera, The Magic Flute. This opera has been the subject of considerable speculation and controversy among music lovers. Presumably, it is based upon a curious pseudo-Egyptian novel entitled The Life of Sethos, taken from the private memoirs of the ancient Egyptians. 
The first English edition of this work was published in London in 1732, translated from the French original of the previous year. The signature of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart from a Masonic Friendship Book. The autograph of Mozart, which appears on the lower half of the sheet, was written in 1787 in Vienna and is accompanied by Masonic symbols and ciphers in the hand of the great composer. The Friendship Book, in which this signature appears, contains many distinguished names associated with Freemasonry and Illuminism. The small symbolic designs, which illustrate the recent article, are from this same book. The libretto of the Magic Flute is attributed to Schikander. There can be no doubt that he made liberal use of the life of Septos in both ritualism and romantic elements of the story as there is nothing to indicate that Sickinger was deeply vested in ancient lore or legendary. It is quite possible that he merely acted as an intermediary between a political secret society and the Austrian public. When modern critics refer to the magic flute as a cosmic opera, they reveal a complete ignorance of the times and circumstances during which the musical drama was composed and produced. There was little humor in the struggle of the Austrian Freemason for survival, nor was it with light mind that the intellectuals of that day sought devious means to reach the public with their ministry of mental emancipation. The magic flute belongs to a cycle of neo-Egyptian metaphysical speculation which occupied a prominent place in the Masonic thinking of that time. Cayostros, Egyptian rites of Freemasonry had produced a profound stir a few years earlier. Saint Germa, past master of esoteric ritualism, had focused attention upon the magic and mystery inherent in the initiatory dramas of ancient Greece and Egypt. He was in Vienna at the time the magic flute was being written. Weishaupt had sounded the clarion call of liberty, equality, and fraternity, which had already overthrown the French monarchy. The characters of Mozart's opera tell a story not to be explained convincingly without recourse to the undercurrent agitating public opinion. As Weishaupt had introduced the name Egypt to represent Austria, we realize that the story of the magic flute supposedly laid in Egypt is really the unveiling of the political corruption of Austria and the expose of the elements dominating Austrian politics. The principal characters of the opera are Queen of the Night, superficially Isis, actually Maria Teresa, Zarasto, High Priest of the Mysteries, actually Ignaz Edler von Born, previously mentioned, Tamino, the hero, supposedly an Egyptian prince, represents the Austria people, the composite hero of a vast political drama. Pamina, the heroine, represents the principles of liberty and equality, which Tamino is attempting to obtain for himself. Manos Tedos, the black man, the villain of the drama, signifies the religious orders which are attempting to catch the soul of the Austrian people. Papagino, the bird catcher, a curious spirit, is the lower octave of Tamino and signifies the unintelligent masses whose fickle devotion is inclined to favor the simple pleasures of life. Although the opera is obviously Masonic, it is far more flamboyant and symbolic than the sober society with which it has been associated. There is only one explanation which fits all the requirements of the facts, and that is that the magic flute is subsequently the rituals of the high degrees of the Illuminati. Of course, certain esoteric materials were deleted from the public spectacle, but the substance is there, challenging the imagination. Tamito, 
the hero was the personification of Weishaupt's scheme to unite the young intellectuals of Europe and form them into a body of progressive and courageous youth, fired with the resolution to overcome the tyranny of the church and state. Sarestro, the Hierophant, represents the governing body of the Illuminist in the person of von Born, who was the moving spirit in Austria. Von Born died the year the opera was produced. He was the high priest of civil liberty, the agent of the industrious little Bavarian professor of canon law. If we accept the rather obvious fact that the Magic Flute was an Illuminist production, we will understand why the opera departed from orthodox masonry but retained many of its symbols and terms. Weishaupt had already used masonry as a principal vehicle for the dissemination of his own ideas. There is much more to the matter than shows on the surface, and we are forced to suspect that the entire program of Illuminism had many implications other than those regarded as reasonable by imaginative historians. The skeptical reader may ask for proof that the magic flute is actually the work of the Illuminati. Naturally, an organization moving secretly is not going to label such a work. The proof is in the actual text itself. The libretto, as it was originally written, to those who understand the symbolic language of the Illuminati, the opera is marked beyond any doubt. We can recommend it heartily to those who wish to improve their knowledge of the Illuminist rituals. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please donate a little to Wards of the Roses through PayPal or Patreon. It is desperately needed. Thank you very much.